Democratic Republic of South Africa. He is a keen researcher into community-based environmental conservation activities and agroforestry projects among the Luo-speaking people in the Lake region of Eastern Africa. That is a short bio of our today's speaker. And ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome him on stage. Welcome, Professor. Take us through. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, my good friend Richard Kipungeno, for moderating this presentation. It has been a moment, momentous, I think, occasion to have this put together so that we can explore this topic, language, people, and plants in East Africa. Our subtopic, as you notice, is an ethno-conservation approach to sustainable living. Why an ethno-conservation approach to sustainable living? Ethno-conservation is a new area which is interesting a lot of people from different disciplines. I am one of the people who have been attracted to ethno-conservation from my own background as a teacher of language, because initially that was my training. I trained in the teaching of English to speakers of other languages. Kenya, as you know, is a former British colony. And the platform we are using is Anglophone. Uh, we are proud to use English, but we are equally proud to encourage the indigenous languages as well. Learning about the environment entails learning about our indigenous languages and our indigenous knowledge systems. But as we interact cross-culturally, then we use English as the medium of communication. Because in Kenya, English is an official language. Swahili is also an official language and it's also a national language. And then our constitution of Kenya 2010 recognizes what is called other languages, other languages, I guess other here means other indigenous African languages spoken within the borders of Kenya. Now, Kenya has two sister countries, and that is uh, Uganda and Tanzania. In my research, I've discovered that there's a very vibrant Nature Uganda uh, group, and more recently, there is Nature Tanzania. And they're doing the same things as Nature Kenya. So let's now go to the goals, the goals and purposes of Ethno Conservation Committee. Now, I met the executive director of Nature Kenya, Dr. Matiku. We had a lengthy discussion and we identified a gap, that there is knowledge gap in ethno-conservation within the work of Nature Kenya. And we agreed that a new committee be formed and launched. And this was done about three, four months ago, and it has been adopted by the executive committee of Nature Kenya, which of course is part of the East Africa uh, Natural History Society. So we have about five bullets on your screen and I'll go through them. Goals and purposes of an ethno-conservation committee. So I am the founding chairman of this ethno-conservation committee of Nature Kenya. So bullet one, conducting research in ethno-conservation 
efforts in Kenya, conducting research, broad research in ethno conservation efforts in Kenya. Two, mounting educational and training programs uh, for community based organizations. So, Kenya is our landscape. Of course, we also have Tanzania and Uganda. We wouldn't mind collaborating in future with our brothers and sisters in Tanzania and in Uganda. And more recently, four other countries have joined the East African community. Um, and those include South Sudan, uh, we have uh, Rwanda, we have Burundi, and, and this year we welcomed the Democratic Republic of Congo, which means East Africa has seven member states, but this organization known as East Africa Natural History Society is active in the original members of the com community, that is Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania but we would be happy to collaborate with those new members of the East African community. Three, or bullet three, documenting indigenous knowledge systems covering the ethno-ecological zones. The, uh, documenting indigenous knowledge systems covering the ethno-ecological zones in Kenya. Notice that we, we are using the prefix ethno, Whenever you see the prefix ethno, then have it in mind that it is emanating from the people. So this kind of conservation emanates from the grassroots people, ethnos, the people. So when you're dealing with grassroots communities, uh, when you are dealing with grassroots communities, then you must of necessity use the languages accessible to them. English is the official language, yes. It's the language used for science and technology and education, especially higher, higher education. But we also have Swahili, which is the lingua franca in Eastern and Central Africa. And then of course, we have the local indigenous languages. So any emphasis on ethno ecology, necessarily means the people at the grassroots level, at the village level, whether it is along the coastal region in Kenya or the central highlands of Kenya, where Gikuyu is the dominant language or the Lake Victoria Basin, where Luo is the dominant language, you must take into account these languages and their indigenous knowledge bases. And then the next bullet is disseminating research findings through multimedia platforms. Now, as members go out to do research, as members uh, write proposals, research proposals and seek funding uh, to do this kind of research on ethno-environmental activities, the findings will need to be communicated to wider audiences. Of course, facilitated by the Secretariat of Nature Kenya, right here at the National Museums of Kenya, the National Museum in Nairobi. So this is a wonderful facility, which has been in existence from 1909, so I would urge the members of Ethno Conservation Committee to take full advantage of the facilities and the good support system, which they have been giving to researchers and educators and community groups for a very long time. So disseminating research findings through multimedia platforms. And then lastly, but of course not least by any means, planning the protection of environment with different people groups, different people groups. Notice that I am avoiding the word tribe. From the 1970s 
during the time of Ngugi, Wationgo, Uwura Nyumba, Taban Lolyong, and Okot Bibitek, they castigated the use of the word tribe. And they said the word tribe is misleading. So Okot Bibitek, whom uh, we know about through his writings, especially the celebrated song of Lawino, in one of his essays, says the definition of tribe is misleading, that a tribe is a group of people, a, a group of primitive people led by a chief. That is misleading, it is wrong. Uh, so in my work, I don't use the word tribe, I use people groups, I also use ethnic groups. So in this presentation, I have focused on planning the protection of environment with different people groups in Kenya. So you can talk about the Agekoyo, you can talk about the Wakamba, those are people groups. You can talk about the Maasai, you can talk about the Luo, you can talk about the Basuba. They are not primitive and they are not led by a chief. They belong to a modern state, Kenya. So we progress, we make some progress in this presentation, and that's the conceptual framework. Why ethno conservation? What is the conceptual framework? The moment you talk about ethno, then what comes into mind is the whole concept of culture. Culture is a very powerful tool in human affairs. And the moment you talk about culture, another concept comes into mind, nature, nature. And that's why we are here. We are here because of nature, Kenya, the natural world, natural history, you can talk about cultural history. You can also talk about natural history. And we are here because of the East African Natural History Society. So we are thinking about people. We are thinking about uh, culture. And we are thinking about nature. So ethnoconservation is an approach to preserving biodiversity heritage through utilization of indigenous knowledge systems in the quest to preserve nature and culture. So when we think of biodiversity, I want to put it simply this way, that biodiversity deals with two kingdoms interacting, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. And that is in a very reducted manner for purposes of conceptualization. I don't want to go into the further subdivisions of science, the sciences uh, known, known as uh, physical sciences, or biological sciences, you know, chemistry, physics, geology, and all those things, earth sciences. I just want to make it basic and biodiversity as far as this presentation is concerned is animal kingdom and plant kingdom. And for this particular lecture, maybe in future we'll have something to do with animals, but this particular one focuses on plants, the plant kingdom. So defining the concept of, of culture helps us to understand ways in which people around the world live in their natural environments or in their natural habitats. So I have a few bullets there just to explain culture. So our first bullet there uh, explains culture as, as uh, distinct from nature. So culture is distinct from nature. But when human beings produce cultural products, they don't produce cultural products from nothing. 
they produce cultural products from something. And what is that something? That something is nature. So culture and nature, are, they work in tandem. They work in tandem. So culture is distinct, yes, but culture depends on nature. The next bullet is culture as knowledge. So, and we could describe indigenous knowledge as cultural knowledge, traditional cultural knowledge, the knowledge which is native, the knowledge which is indigenous, <clears throat> the knowledge which is culture specific to the people group. That's culture as knowledge. And that's culture as knowledge about plants, culture as knowledge about animals, all these things depend on culture. And then the next item is culture as communication. So through culture, we communicate. We communicate a number of things. I want to give an example of the way you dress. When you see someone dressed in a certain way, you, without talking to that person, you will make up your mind and say, that person must be a Muslim or a, or a Somali, a Somali and a Muslim. But you have not spoken to that person. You have simply seen the person uh, crossing the road somewhere around the Museum Hill, for example, because right now I'm giving this lecture from Museum Hill. Let me give that as an example. Or when I look out through the window and I see someone wrapped up in a red blanket, then I will, uh, I will uh, make up my mind and say, maybe that person is from the Ma community, the Ma speaking community. And Ma speaking community could be Ma Maasai mainstream or the brothers and sisters, the, uh, their brothers and sisters from Samburu or Il Chamus. So those are the Ma speaking people and their dress code will communicate something about their identity. Same thing with uh, an Indian who is wearing a turban. That turban will tell you something about the identity of that person from the Indian subcontinent, possibly resident in Ngara or Pangani or Westlands area, not far away from the National Museums of Kenya headquarters where I am seated as I give this talk. So culture communicates something. And then culture as a system of mediation. Yeah, there's a, a small typo there. It's not meditation, it is mediation. Culture as a system of mediation. So culture links one point to another point. So culture is critical in mediation and association of let's say ideas or concepts and so on. Then culture as a system of practices. People have different practices, whether they are initiation practices, whether they are marriage practices, whether they are uh, birth or, uh, rituals, what accompanies or surrounds the birth of a male child or a female child. There are lots of cultural practices and also natural practices because some hubs will be used in a traditional setting. Some hubs will be used, some trees will be used, some animals will be slaughtered, food will be prepared, and people will come and sing songs in praise of the new baby. From one culture to another, they have different ways of expressing the arrival of a new baby. So culture, as a system of practices. I want to, oh, I want to explain further that uh, culture can also be at a very high tech level. For example, uh, the medical, the modern medical practitioners, they behave in a certain way and they dress in a certain way. Their overcoats, which are white in color, what do those overcoats and white in color represent? I will not answer that. 
I will leave that to the audience. Why do they dress like that? Uh, an interesting similarity of a white overcoat is a butcher. People who work in Dagoretti slaughterhouse, a lot of them wear white overcoats. The difference is that the overcoats are spilled with blood because they, 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 they slaughter <laughs> many animals and distribute meat to Nairobi and its environs. And of course, some people who work in the outlets, the meat outlets, they wear white overcoats, just like doctors and surgeons, you see? What's the cultural significance of that color or that piece of uh, material culture, the overcoat? And why is it white? Now, that's for you to investigate as a researcher, as a teacher, as a student. Uh, yes, that's an example of, of uh, a practice. Cultures are a system of practice. Lawyers, the way they dress, the judges are supposed to the, the, the advocates in the Supreme Court or in the Court of Appeal or in the High Court or in the subordinate courts, which are headed by magistrates. They dress in a particular style. The police officers last year, or was, or was it the other year, we changed our colors, police colors. I didn't like the police colors we were introducing. I like the old ones, but now I am used to the new ones and uh, I have settled down for them and uh, I appreciate them as I see them doing their work. So that police color, color blue. Okay, uh, then culture as a system of participation. So culture enables different people to participate. Take the example of a religious ceremony. Before you uh, participate in that religious ceremony, initiation is done. In the Anglican Church of Kenya and the entire Anglican communion, they have infant baptism, for example, but they also have uh, uh, infant baptism and naming, uh, but they also have the ceremony of confirmation when you are admitted into full membership of, of the All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi and by extension, a full member of the Anglican, Anglican communion worldwide. So that's an example of culture as a system of participation. Same, same thing with the circumcision of both girls and boys. In Kenya, we have outlawed FGM. That's female genital mutilation. But we encourage male circumcision, which I will not call uh, male genital mutilation because it's more acceptable. But the female uh, genital mutilation has been a contentious subject from about the 1920s in central Kenya. And that is what inspired Ngugiwa Thiongo's book, The River Between, when he explores this tradition of the Agekuyu people in central Kenya of circumcising their girls. And uh, the Church of Scotland in Kikuyu was against it. And it, crot, it, it brought a, uh, across different problems in the community, dividing people. Some people were for it, others were not. And those of you who have read The River Between, then you know what I'm talking about. And that I would recommend that you read it. Uh, the River Between is a classic among Gugi Wationgo's publications. So that's participation. The little girl wanted to be a full woman, a grown woman, and she wanted to do this through the traditional methods of circumcision. Uh, in South Sudan, they have the practice of scarification, especially of the faces. So you, you meet somebody in the streets, whether in New York or in London, you say, this must be a Sudanese, a South Sudanese. And he must be from the people group known as the Dinka or the Nuer, 
or the Shiluk. And they have maintained and conserved those cultural practices. Now, we have the next subtitle, language. So why language? Why language? Now, archaeologists, many of them have gone through the National Museums of Kenya. From the days of Leakey, Leakey Senior, LSB L. Leakey and his wife, Mary, they did a lot of work on uh, excavating fossils of the ancestors of human beings in East Africa. They did a great, they, they, they did a uh, wonderful job. It was a great job they did. And their son, Dr. Leakey, Richard Leakey, who passed on uh, early this year, I believe, continued with, continued with the work of his parents, paleoanthropology. Now, Richard Leakey in some of his books talks about language and intelligence and he links language and intelligence from the evidence gathered uh, in his paleoanthropological uh, inquiries. So language is as old as humanity. Language is as old as humanity. Now, imagine a situation where we had no language. I am seated here, we are using technology, but we, all, we are also using language. Any language, whether it's Latin, Greek, Hebrew, English, French, you know, the colonial languages which we now use worldwide and in the United Nations, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese. We have Arabic as well, which is quite wide spoken. And in East Africa, we have Swahili, which was spread through the east coast of Africa, trading activities, which included slave trade, you know, the history of slave trade and uh, elef uh, elephant tusks and so on. The interaction between East and, east and Central Africa and the Arab world, that is important. That's historical. And some of you are historians and you might be interested in studying that kind of uh, uh, historical past and the impact of that historical past on the present and of course future. So language is part of the cultural resources shared by different people groups and language expresses our belief systems, language explains our biodiversity. You know, we can't discuss what we don't know. So language helps us to codify that knowledge, whether the knowledge is about the plant kingdom or the animal kingdom, uh, you know, embraced by our natural environment, language is at the center. Hence my title, language, people and plants in East Africa. So language helps us to access that knowledge about the environment. We give the plants names. Why do we give plants those specific names? We use language. So the shared knowledge of a people group includes the names given to plants and the implied meanings of those names in culture specific configurations. And then lastly, in this section, members of a people group share a common language and a common cu culture. And language and culture help, help them to interpret meaning within their environment. They are, uh, so they develop what I call common environmental knowledge and language is at the center, it's at the core of that process. Yes, so I, I want to introduce the concept of ethnobotany. In fact, 
in my readings and in my research at the moment, I have added paleo, paleo ethnobotany. And I have affiliation with the National Museums of Kenya as a research associate in the Department of Earth Sciences. And I have been thinking of linguistics, how linguistics as a discipline can relate with paleo ethnobotany. But for our purposes here, ethnobotany is enough, not paleo. Paleo has to do with a study of the, the past, studying the past of plants. Recently, I came across uh, a forest which had been submerged and which was discovered by archaeologists and, and paleontologists, you know, a forest system. That would fall under paleo ethno <coughs> botany. Uh, but in this case, we are just interested in ethnobotany. So botany as responded to by different people groups. And of course, within the National Museums of Kenya, we have the herbarium. The herbarium is a storehouse, as it were. The storage of different and unique plants dried up, preserved from 1909. So those of you who are botanical or biological, you can take good advantage of our East Africa herbarium house at the National Museums of Kenya. So some ethnobotanical names derive their meanings from one. This is from my study. And that study was published in this uh, monograph. The monograph is on, it's a study of Lu ethnobotanical terminology. It's a green book. If you go to the Kenya Museum Society bookshop, you might be lucky and find a copy. I think they, they told me yesterday that they still have copies and you can buy yourself a copy from John, who is in charge of that bookshop. So some ethnobotanical names derive their meanings from the characteristics of plants. Each plant has its unique characteristics. And you see that image. In Luo, we call that plant Nyanyodi. And birds like to feed on the nectar from that plant. This plant occurs around the compound of the National Museums of Kenya. If you go to the herbal garden, you'll find it there. So the characteristics of plants help human beings to define the plant kingdom. Then the uses of plants. What do we use the plants for? So in different languages of the world, you will discover that the people give plants the names related, very closely related to the uses to which they put the plants. Three, human attributes of plants. Some plants have human attributes. Some plants have human attributes. So human beings will associate those plants with a human attribute. For example, in Luo, there's a plant which, when you cut it, it produces sap, which is red in color. And what do we know as having red in color, have, uh, being red or having the red color, blood. And the word for blood in Luo is remo. So the Luo people call that plant a remo, which means the bloody one, the bloody plant. So that's an example of uh, you know, attributes from blood, human blood or animal blood for that matter. Then plants might also be given names based on animal attributes. Uh, they can also be given names from, their, from folklore, from the people's folklore, you know, songs. There is a herbal plant which is very sensitive to touch. 
and the kids play with it. They touch it and sing a song. And as they sing the song, uh, the sensitive hub folds up its leaves. They call it a wura wur, and they sing the song. It's a, it's a, a playing song, but it also helps the kids to learn about their environment. And that is called a wura wur. A wura wur ban piende kachonya ribiro. A wura wur ban piende kachonya ribiro. So that's a song which children sing and they touch the sensitive leaves of that particular plant and the plant folds its leaves and the kids play with it. That's a plant deriving its name from folklore. And then of course, we have the borrowing of words from other languages. We have names which we have borrowed uh, from other languages, especially English and Swahili in this region. But when you go into Swahili, you find that Swahili has a lot of borrowing from yet other languages. I'm told that Swahili has probably about 30% of lexical borrowing. There is not a single language on earth which has not borrowed from another language. So some people talk about pure language. There's nothing like pure language. If by purity, you mean uh, words or lexical items. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, and I would like then to conclude this presentation of language, people, and plants in East Africa by going back to the objectives. Let's go back to the objectives of our committee. Then after I've looked at those objectives or call them goals and purposes of the Ethno Conservation Committee, I will conclude extempore, which means not from the script, but from some of my thoughts uh, on what this committee can do or what individual researchers might wish to do. So the committee hopes to conduct research in ethno-conservation efforts in Kenya. The committee hopes to mount educational and training programs for community-based groups. The committee hopes to document indigenous knowledge systems covering different ethno-ecological zones in Kenya, then disseminating the research findings and planning projects, uh, which might help in the protection of the different, the, uh, the environments of the different people groups. So conclusions and recommendations. One, we need to identify groups, different groups and individuals who are working on projects towards environmental conservation and sustainable living in the community. I have in mind the Tana River Delta. You have been doing quite a bit of work there, Nature Kenya, uh, our secretariat and the associating scientists have done a wonderful job down there. They have also raised concerns around Lake Victoria. I have in mind the, uh, the Rivayala swamp, you know, Rivayala system and the Nzoya system and the Lake Kanyaboli system as the rivers flow into the Great Lake Victoria and the threat on the wetlands there. I think that we need to link up with people who are facing challenges, environmental challenges like the River Yala swamp, the neighboring community, and other areas. We can identify several other areas. I, I also have in mind the National Museums of Kenya dotting different sites across the Republic of Kenya, how people uh, oriented at our national museum sites. I'm thinking of El Geo Maraquet, there is a museum there, but what about the Keio and the Maraquet who live around that museum? 
do they look at it as an isolated place which was planted by Muzungu? Muzungu means the British colonialist or the European colonialist who ruled at that time before 1963. Then Tim Lich Oinga in Migori. Tim Lich Oinga in Migori, who <coughs> built that fort, which has similar characteristics as the ones we get in Shonaland in Zimbabwe, the great walls of Zimbabwe. Now, and how can we conserve those areas? The cultural aspects and the natural histories of those uh, protected sites, whether they are world protected sites or whether they are gazetted sites by the National Museums of Kenya. Then the next recommendation is empowering a new generation of people who are championing social change leading towards ethno conservation and of course the integrity of the environment. Then my next point is cultivating in people the cultural values. Cultural values here also include ethical values, which encourage natural diversity of plants in the environment. Do we treat our environment uh, uh, with what philosophers called ethical minimum? Or are we wanton in our approach to the environment, destroying rare trees, rare uh, forests, and pillaging some of the forests or the natural resources we have? So cultivating in people that ethical sense. I think this committee can help with sensitizing different groups, whether they are people groups or whether they are government experts working with different ministries, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and of course, different parastatals, which touch on our environmental integrity. And then, and then lastly, supporting food security systems. We derive our food, our shelter, and many other things from our plants in our environment. And food security is very, very important. Food security, ensuring food security, because a lot of our foods, a lot of our medicines are plant-based. So the Ethno Conservation Committee will look into those areas in terms of research, in terms of education and training, in terms of documenting indigenous knowledge, systems relating to plants, and disseminating that knowledge or research findings in different forums, uh, different platforms, multimedia platforms, and then planning the protection of environment with different people groups in Kenya. That brings us to the end of this presentation on uh, language, people, and plants in East Africa, an ethno-conservation approach to sustainable living. Notice that I have not limited myself to Kenya because birds do not know those boundaries. Plants do not know the, those boundaries. They don't know the difference between Arusha and Nairobi and Kampala. And hence, I'm happy that Nature Kenya has sister organizations, Nature Tanzania, which is based in Arusha, and Nature Uganda, which is based in Kampala, Uganda. And Nature Kenya, we are based at the National Museums of Kenya headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for such an in insightful uh, presentation. It has really been very, very educative. Now, at this uh, particular moment, I welcome, I open the floor to every participant. If you have um, a question, a comment that you would like uh, to share directly with the uh, professor, uh, you are free to do so. I had uh, initially encouraged uh, everyone to maybe share them through the chat box, but I have uh, one comment from uh, Tracy Hagai. 
this was such a wonderful inaugural lecture for the Ethnoconservation Committee. Professor Ojuang has done a fantastic job in outlining our scope and goals. As a member, I am looking forward to collaborating in not only academic ventures or publications, but also in actively ensuring that impactful work is done with the various communities that we will encounter in our ethno conservation journey. Thank you, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful comment. So I, <laughs> I, I, I welcome uh, anyone who has another question, another uh, comment. Okay, from Margaret Buzz, a, a very, a very time talk when the world is at a tipping point. I think it's a very timely talk. Hi, Margaret Vaz. Hope you are fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a comment here from um, Rispa. I really appreciate this detailed presentation. It is so clear how human activities influence language and nature conservation and use. Thank you. Thank you, Rispa. Okay. Anyone who has a question uh, directly to Professor, maybe you can. Hi, Margaret, I see you. <laughs> I, I actually have a very, um, I think the talk is so wonderful at a time when it is so critical for the local communities who face the disparity between survival and the use of the local, you know, whatever they have locally, because sometimes it is a matter of making a decision between putting food on their table today or starving. And they, they, they seem to have no choice because they push from some directions and not always for the best of that community. Hi, Margaret. I think we lost you somewhere. Oh, I was going to say, okay, I'll just move myself. Putting food on the table. Okay, Ma Margaret, we, we can't hear we can't hear you clearly. I think your network is not uh, stable. We can't hear you. Okay, I will. Okay, maybe you can maybe you can drop a, a text through the chat box, and we will be able to read through. From uh, Dave Hilliard, this was a very interesting talk, and it was good to hear references made to several books. Thank you, Dave. Uh, David Ndungu, thank you, Prof, for such enriching presentation. And uh, Elizabeth says a very interesting presentation and very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Rispa has uh, raised her hand. Maybe you can unmute and uh, speak. Rispa? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Prof, for uh, educating us. Actually, it, it is such a learning uh, platform. I hope we will have um, a lot of this from time to time. Uh, I want to say, or I would like to ask, what is your opinion on linguistic migration? And I want to give an example of uh, what I noticed from some young girls uh, who are in Kenya as uh, refugees in Kakuma. And uh, when they went back home, <coughs> I, I happened to have gone to work uh, in South Sudan. And I found these two girls speaking between themselves in Kiswahili and not local Arabic, which they use in, in South Sudan. And, and for me, it was something very interesting that 
They came in as refugees. They have gone back home with the language and a language which is now appreciated in East Africa and also being used as a working language in the all of in the in the AU. So um, can you uh, talk to us a bit on uh, linguistic migration and I would say its impact on social cultural development, if if you may. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Rispa Akinyi. Bete. Uh, have you have you muted yourself now? Um, uh, yes, I you can you, you can mute yourself, and I hope you are hearing me. Yes. Uh, and Nature Kenya, can you hear me? Nature Kenya. Yes, you are loud and clear, Prof. Go on. Thank you, Nature Kenya. Now, <clears throat> that's a very beautiful question from Rispa. Very very beautiful question. Migration, human beings. Human beings are always on the move <laughs> every single day. Even when you are seated down, you are still on the move. In your thoughts and in your emotions, you can be sitting in your house, drinking wuji like myself, wimbi. And my friend Richard is calling me and asking me, Prof, where are you? And I'm telling him I'm on the move. I'll be with you in the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes. So my, mentally, I'm already at the Nature Kenya office, but physically I am drinking Uji. Uji is uh, our staple of, of uh, it's a drink from uh, Finger Millet, which it's my staple breakfast. I have to drink it. But mentally, I am already thinking of the presentation in the afternoon. So mentally you travel, you travel physically, you travel spiritually. Now, migration, a very powerful topic. One day we should look at migration, okay? whether it is forced migration or whether it is not forced migration. The Sudanese- uh, Professor, let me interject a, a little. I, I talked the language or linguistic migration. Yeah, I'm so coming. It from there. Yes, so linguistic migration. Now, people are forced. You can mute yourself, Rispa. Uh, people are forced to move from their homes to a place they do not know. And eventually United Nations Commission for Refugees settled them in Kakuma in Northern, in, in Turkana County, Kenya, or in uh, Northeastern Kenya. There's another camp there. Or in Uganda, they also have camps. So the United Nations settles them. Let's talk of Kakuma. Now, some kids are born there by refugee parents, whether you are forced to run away or whether you came on your own volition. Now, when you come to a refugee camp, life must continue. And you discover that the people in Turkana County speak Turkana, yes, as mother tongue, but they also speak, uh, speak the lingua franca. So the kids are endowed naturally to acquire languages of their catchment areas. So those kids acquired Swahili because Swahili was the language of their catchment area in the schools within Turkana refugee settlement or refugee camp. Lots and lots of my students from South Sudan speak Swahili. They speak it very well. There are the settled refugees, the self-settled refugees in Nairobi and I have a small group in uh, Ruiru of Anyuak speaking people. They are kids. I have visited them many times. I've even worshipped with them in the Anyuak church. They preach and worship in their church. But the younger people know Swahili and English. And their kids are multilingual. 
When you talk of linguistic migration, it simply means that a language migrates from one point to another. I think that's what you mean. So after they are resettled at home, when they go back and they resettle home, they will go with a new knowledge of Swahili. And some of them have learned even Dikuyu around Ruiru. And some of them speak Luo, Kenyan brand of Luo, those who have lived in Kisumu. And some of them have acquired uh, languages like uh, Kalenjin. Uh, there are some of them who live in, in Kitale and in Eldoret and Nakuru. So yes, once you learn a language, you keep it. It's a resource, isn't it? Uh, and they even learn about the environment where they are settled. And Kakuma is the best illustration you are talking about. So you learn a language, you keep it. It's part of your knowledge. You keep it and you use it when it is necessary. The only problem is when they don't have their native languages. So that's what we call attrition. And we have a lot of that in Nairobi. We have a lot of that in uh, Kisumu city, Nakuru uh, city, Mombasa city. You find people who, whose parents moved to those big cities and then they use Swahili as their primary language but they have lost their mother tongue. They have lost Gikuyu, they have lost Luo, they have lost Maasai. Should we celebrate because we have lost those languages? Our kids have lost those languages. No, we should not celebrate. We should do something to resuscitate some of these disappearing languages. And government should provide funding for that. In the Ministry of Education, and also in other ministries. And when I'm talking of ethno-conservation, I include language, I include culture, not just the environment. And uh, I hope I've answered you. So these two beautiful girls who went back to Sudan and they were speaking Swahili, they also need to reclaim their heritage <laughs> and learn Shiluk, Anyuak, Dindinga, Kuku, and what have you, because it is a resource. I want to give you the example of my friend who is in the country right now. He's from Sudan. He's called Taban Loliong. Taban Loliong was born in Kajokeji in South Sudan. He's a writer and a social critic. And then his parents moved to Northern Uganda and settled among the Acholi people. So he was brought up as an Acholi but his original uh, ethnic group is known as Kuku and the Kuku people are Bari speaking. So, but he was brought up as an Acholi because he went to school with Acholi children in Northern Uganda. He learned the language and perfected it. One of his teachers was Okot Pibitek at, uh, in Gulu, Gulu High School where Okot Pibitek taught him. Then later they became writers and friends and they teamed up in Nairobi. Of course, for a long time, people thought Taban Loliong was a Ugandan, including his publishers. But after he toured the world and worked in Kenya, in Papua New Guinea, and in other parts of the world, he said he wanted to make a confession. And he declared that he was not a Ugandan, he was a South Sudanese. He was from Kuku tribe or ethnic group. Remember, I said we shouldn't use the word tribe, ethnic group, or nation, sub nationality. And he speaks Luo, Kenyan Luo. He speaks Acholi, but he also speaks Kuku. So he's a, a multilingual person. He's a multilingual person. I always enjoy interacting with him. And this week, he this week he launched his book after Troy, based on the Greek uh, uh, story or narrative, folk narrative of Troy, which was besieged for over 10 years. You know the story of Troy, but he has used Troy as a figure of speech of a war which took more than 10 years, but he's using that to talk about war in South Sudan. And what the impact of war on the people and on the environment. So I'm trying to answer Rispa. I don't know whether I have succeeded that yes, languages migrate, 
they migrate with people. The way English migrated with people to Australia and English migrated to, with the English people to New Zealand and to South Africa. We have South African English speaking people. The Dutch speaking people in South Africa, now they call themselves the Afrikaners. And we have English migrating to North America. Now they say, no, 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 this is American English. This is not British. This is not British English. This is American. And they have also tried to, to have their own spelling systems to make them distinct and have distinct identity from British English or English English or Queen's English. And right now we have a king in England. So I don't know whether they will now talk about King's English, King Charles III. So yes, I agree with you. Languages move, languages migrate. In that sense, linguistic, mig you, you are termin terminology of linguistic migration. Yes, there is linguistic migration as it were. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for explaining uh, that. Uh, Margaret, we lost her, but uh, she has dropped uh, I think a message that uh, she was uh, trying to say. And uh, she said, I, I was trying to say that some communities are at risk of putting food on the table versus losing their rich cultural influences in their neighborhood. And another one from uh, Bozo, <laughs> the presentation is excellent, but we'll be interested to know more about ethno-conservation and with how members of the people connect with climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor, you have something to yes. say on that? That is a very good question. You cannot talk of ethno-conservation and forget climate change. You see, in our languages, we had certain terms used. And Rispa Akini, Pete can help me on this. We had four seasons in a year. In Luo, Rispa, can you give me, I am throwing this back at some of the participants. Rispa or any other Luo speaking participant. Rispa, can you give me the four seasons in a year? Um, I may not know all four, but I know in the beginning of the year, we had Chiri. This is a time when there was a lot of rain and it was a time for planting. Then there is a, a time called Oro, which is a dry spell. Mm -hmm. And then there is Opon, uh, another time for planting again after harvesting. Mm. So uh, these seasons were, uh, there was a season for harvesting called Keo and a, a season, for, uh, I think therefore I'm getting them, a season for, for weeding called uh, uh, Doyo. So mostly we have used uh, these seasons also to name children. Children born during uh, weeding, which is doyo. A girl is called a doyo and uh, a boy is called odoyo. Then um, the season for, uh, uh, for the second planting in the year, which is opon. Some people have also named children opon. But I haven't had people naming children Chiri. Okay. Or uh, <laughs> Professor, I've tried. Eh? Yes, you have tried. Yes, I think so. You can pick it from there. Thank you very much, Rispa. Yes, so I'm trying to respond to climate change. So the, when we were growing up, I think it happened to everybody, whether Nyanza region or coastal region or central Kenyan highlands. We expected the rains at a certain time, Chwiri, the long rains, Chwiri as Rispa says, the long rains. And it would be very cold. Sometimes you'd not see the sun. That's no longer happening. 
climate change has taken its toll. But we need to develop content on climate change and content that is relevant to the people which can be understood by the people, by women's groups, youth groups, local church groups, mosques. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of organized groups which we can use as entry points uh, or temples. In my neighborhood here within the museum, there are so many temples. I have visited a few and had a meal with the Hare Krishna people who are vegetarians, but the, their food is very good. And they say, nobody should go hungry within 15, a radius of 15 kilometers. And the museum is within a radius of 15 kilometers. And I had a student who had very little money, was from Italy. And he was self-sponsoring, he was a B anthropology student. So one, once he was writing an essay and I told him, why don't you write an essay about a language group, a minority language group within, the, within Nairobi. So he discovered the Hare Krishna temple and interviewed them and they offered him lunch and they told him you can come for lunch every day. So this man had double luck in the sense that he wrote, he wrote his research paper, but he was fed every day. So one day he told me, Mwalimu, one day I should take you there and you'll really enjoy yourself. So I went and uh, I had the vegetarian meal, very rich vegetarian meal. Now, why am I talking about that? Uh, food and climate change, very, very powerful. Now in Kenya, you know, Kenya, we have to think about Kenya afresh. We say we are an agricultural country. Is that true? I don't know. We talk of arid and semi-arid lands. I am not a geologist. I am not a geographer. I'm a language teacher. My basic training is a teacher of English. Yeah, that's my basic training, teacher of English. And I tell stories through language, okay? I'm a storyteller. Uh, I look around and I ask myself, why are we saying we are an agricultural country? Why are we not looking at the pastoral groups in the dry lands and the semi-dry lands, the arid lands? As soon as you drive out of Nairobi, I live in Kileleshwa, but if I'm going to visit my friends in Siokimau, and then I drive all the way to uh, the famous place, Kitengela, or Atiriva, or where Deista University is situated. It's a totally different climatic zone. And the thin dust which blows across the plains, the Ati plains, what does that tell you? Ukambani, for example, has some very green parts, but it also has some very dry parts. So we should be talking about arid and semi-arid lands. Maybe 75% or 80, but our geographers, our biologists who are interested in ecosystems can give us more precise uh, maps and percentages of how much is dry and how, and why is the desert increasing? What are our reasons? In other words, the Ethno Conservation Committee is open to people in biological sciences, in physical sciences, in art sciences, and they can bring their knowledge, their expertise, their skills, and help not just the committee, but also reach out to communities so that the communities can also respond in their own ways to what a global process, which is now known as climate change and the impact of climate change and food systems and even health. So that would be my response. 
Nature Kenya. Richard, that's my Thank response. You. Yes, that's my response. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for that uh, comprehensive response. I see also, there's another comment also from uh, Dave Hilliard. He says, mankind is losing his connection with the natural world. <laughs> and it is so important that we encourage people not to lose touch with their ethnic background, but to keep hold of that indigenous knowledge. Yes. Please, can I recommend a, wonder, a wonderful book for all to read? It yes. is not based in Africa, but its essence could be applied worldwide with indigenous wisdom. Which we um, which we must embrace. The book is called Braiding Sweet Grass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I thoroughly recommend it. Asante Sana for a good presentation. Yeah. And where, which country is he from? I'm very curious. Okay. I love what you said. <laughs> but which country is he from? Uh, Dave, uh, if you can hear us, maybe you can. Uh, Let him. He can project can where you are from. <laughs> or he can project his voice. We can or you can speak up. You <laughs> can speak up, yeah. Uh, Dave, I can love, you hear us? I love what he's saying. I love what Dave is saying. Okay. Hi, hi, the Dave. Can you say something? Yes. Go uh, ahead. Asante, I am from the UK. Okay, Dave is from the UK. Yes. Welcome. Welcome to Nairobi, Kenya. Uh <laughs> I don't know what UK looks like now, but I was a student in England, in Birmingham to be more precise, the big heart of England. Yes, I agree with Dave. And uh, I will request Nature Kenya Secretariat to acquire the book and give us, how, give us the details of how we can get the book. And I would also like to say that uh, my research, my doctoral research, my PhD topic was on the pedagogical value of indigenous knowledge for food security. Pedagogical means teaching or educational value. Do our indigenous wisdom systems have educational value? Can they add value to our children, to ourselves, to our adults, to our communities? The answer is yes. And that's what Dave is advocating for. So I agree with him absolutely. And uh, I promise him that I will read his book before the next talk. <laughs> I will read his book and compare <laughs> with, our, <laughs> with the, our sources. And I want to add something I want to add something that at the moment I am affiliated to the National Museums of Kenya as a research associate. And uh, I did 34 years of teaching at the University of Nairobi, most of it at the Institute of African Studies within the museum. My offices were situated in the museum, but right now, I call myself a professor at large because I have since moved out of the University of Nairobi. I still, I still talk to them, but my university is the world. And I'm glad to meet people like Dave <laughs> using this channel. <laughs> and I hope we had people from Uganda and from Tanzania. This is the best channel one can ever find and exchange knowledge. And I would also refer us to say African sage philosophy, which was championed by Henry Odera Oruka. I will avail some of the texts, some of those books are out of print. I will avail some of the titles to the Secretariat of Nature Kenya. There's one particular book which was on philosophy, environment, and ethics. It was edited by Kalesto Juma, the late Kalesto Juma, and the late Henry Odera Oruka. Why am I referring to these old people? You know, I met somebody the other day. No, I didn't meet him. He called me, but he annoyed me during the telephone conversation. He annoyed me because he's a historian. 
and he was asking me, why are you still talking about Taban Loliong? Taban Loliong is over 80. Then I, then I told him, okay, uh, then let's kill him. Let's kill him. Because if you don't want us to talk about him, let's kill all the wise people who are 80 or 75 and above. So he got shocked. Now, I don't use the, the word late. The British or the English people say the late so-and-so, the late so-and-so. But when they are referring to Queen Elizabeth or her father, King George, they don't say the late King George. They don't say the late, because the king is dead, long live the king. The queen is dead, long live the queen. There is a tradition followed in the royal family, but also in our families, even as commoners. We live on. Late for what? Late for dinner or late for a presentation like this one? I was about to be late for this particular one. So would you call me the late or you are? Because I was late for a meeting. <laughs> what am I saying? The point I'm making here is that once you write a book, you don't die. Okot Bitek is alive, okay? Uh, Francis Mbuga is alive. Jen Nandwa is alive. All these people have left us tons and tons of books. So our duty is to go and retrieve some of that knowledge, whether it is cultural knowledge, whether it is uh, natural knowledge, like the man who inspired me to do this work He's dead now, but he's alive. John Ongayo Pokwaro, who was based at the museum and later the University of Nairobi from 1968. And yesterday I was looking at his, the funeral service booklet. He died for three, four years ago, and he's alive through his books. So when we conserve knowledge, when we retrieve, when we document, when we transmit, then we become immortal. We become immortalized. That knowledge continues, even though you are physically, you are physically left the, this existence and you are cremated or you are buried on the soil, planet Earth. So I'm saying that these ideas, if we retrieve them, posterity, our grandchildren our, and our great grandchildren will benefit from this. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. That's very powerful indeed. Uh, for the interest of time, I see we have uh, five minutes. I will go through some comments here from RISPA. Ethno-conservation committee can engage in environmental protection and conservation by creating awareness on climate change adaptation and mitigation through planting tree according to members age. If you are 30 years old, plant 30 trees around your village. Out of the 30, 10 should be fruit trees. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rispa, for that challenge. I hope the members will take, take it up seriously. And uh, Dave finally said, I think you will enjoy it very much. I only the book itself. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, um, Maybe anyone with a burning concern, a question before we bring the session to an end? Um, I, I want to say something. Eh? Yes, Rispa. There is, um, there is a working group established by the, by the Ministry of Environment. It is called Kenya Climate Change Working Group. And I know some of our members here are, are members of that group, like myself. We are working on climate change issues. And uh, I've been thinking that uh, Ethno Conservation Committee of, the, of Nature Kenya should join this working group and uh, get actively involved in issues of conservation of the environment and climate change. And uh, the membership is still open. I think sometimes back I shared this with the professor. 
And I still want to insist that it is important that the committee becomes a member because it is like a think tank on climate change, but also implementing uh, certain climate change activities. And uh, Professor mentioned uh, the, the Tana Delta, he mentioned Yala, and of course, these other places where mm -hmm. our presence can be made visible but that can really work well through Kenya Climate Change Working Group. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Maybe as you also uh, wait for Professor for his uh, closing remarks. Uh, if you are interested in uh, joining uh, the Ethno Conservation Committee of uh, Nature Kenya, you can always uh, drop us an email to office at Nature Kenya. In fact, I'm just uh, sharing through the chat box, the contact, and uh, we'll be able to link you up with our new Ethno Conservation Committee. And also maybe I will uh, request uh, Professor, if um, you can drop your contacts through the chat box right there, in case uh, any of the participants would like to reach you directly, then that is fine. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us today for our virtual talk. It has been um, very, very interesting indeed. So maybe anyone with uh, a last uh, question or comment? Uh, sorry, I got lost. The... <laughs> uh, but I Margaret. I just wanted to say I was listening to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. It's always a great pleasure having you on board. And uh, I hope you're you're enjoying your time in, in Kenya. You've always been joining us from Canada, but uh, I know currently you are around the country and uh, keep enjoying our <laughs> biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor, your closing remark as we end the session. Yes, my closing remark, I would like to recognize a silent listener by the name Madenge Thiongo. You see in the house, Madenge Thiongo. If, if he's in the house, he could take the mic. Madenge Thiongo is an MA conservation anthropology candidate at the University of Nairobi. I think he joined and uh, is not around at the moment, but I had seen uh, Madenge in. Yes, I want to acknowledge him. He was my student and, and uh, at the University of Nairobi. And I'm glad that he is applying his anthropology in this area of ethnoconservation. I want to appreciate another student from the University of Nairobi, uh, Haggai, Tracy, is, is Tracy still in the house? Yes, she's still, she made yes, I'm still in yeah. the house. Kindly uh, project your voice. We want to hear how your voice sounds. <laughs> you have completed your coursework, but now you're working, you're looking for a topic for your thesis. Can you tell us something? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Tracy. Uh, hello, my name is Tracy Hagai. I'm a master's candidate at the University of Nairobi. Uh, my aim is in anthropology of conservation. And so ethnoconservation is a topic that's very close to my heart and to my acad academic activities. I'm very glad and honored to be a member of the Ethnoconservation Committee of Nature Kenya because you guys are we are going to do such wonderful things and I know we're going to have uh, resources at our disposal that we might not find elsewhere and I just hope that as a committee we'll be able to have such impactful change in the society in general. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And any other student from anthropology I associated with recently? before I moved on in, uh, in February this year. I still remember them. I know I have BA graduates who have not proceeded to MA. They hope to go on with the conservation. I have in mind Kiprotich. I don't know whether she's in attendance. 
Kiprotich and any other. So we quite a few people were represented from the anthropology program at the University of Nairobi, and they are focusing on ethno conservation. The reason I am making this uh, known is that uh, when I was at the University of Nairobi, I introduced a course entitled Language and Biodiversity. That was the course. And I taught a group. I had only two students at MA level. One of them works at the Institute of Primatology. Another one called Limbe. Limbe works with the United Nations system. And I think she's somewhere in Afghanistan. I don't know whether she attended this meeting, but we started off as a class. Then I said, why can't I expand this? And I talked to Dr. Matiku and Dr. Matiku said, uh, he advised me that let's make it ethno conservation. It will be more encompassing and uh, it will include a lot of people. So I want to thank Dr. Matiku. I want to thank, thank the entire Nature Kenya fraternity. And uh, I was expecting somebody from Tanzania. So before I conclude, if there is anybody from Tanzania, uh, Nature Tanzania and Nature Uganda, then uh, uh, Richard can grant them that opportunity. Otherwise, I feel very excited. It's a long time since I gave a lecture. This lecture has revived me. Next year, I might give another two or three, <laughs> God willing, as we develop this whole idea of ethno-conservation for sustainable living. Now, if there is anybody from Tanzania or Uganda, then I leave that to the moderator. You will see how to handle it or any other person for that matter. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your closing remarks. And to the entire Ethno Conservation Committee members, uh, you have done exceptionally well. Thank you very much. This was your inaugural uh, presentation, and we look forward to interacting more and more the coming year. As Professor has said, he's looking forward to doing a presentation, maybe two or three, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And uh, we will always want to see the members of the Ethno Conservation Committee engage our broader uh, membership. So thank you, thank you very much, everyone. I wish you a lovely weekend ahead and happy festive season ahead. Thank you very much and see you all virtually next year. Thank you. <laughs>